It is not what we have, but what we enjoy that constitutes our abundance. We often see our modern society as having come so far, yet we find so many helpful answers to our most common problems in the deepest trenches of history. For all its accomplishments and progress, America remains in many ways a mad scramble for wealth, possessions, and identity. In this mad scramble, one thing stands out above the rest. Cash. There is no king in America, except cash. Cash overcomes our principles, values, culture, and judgment as the ultimate factor for greatness. But is it great? It is necessary, in relation to identifying proper representation of values, to conduct a transvaluation of greatness. That is, what we as a culture and a society seem to define as great in the individual. In America, money is God. Money is seen as a universal betterment, as if its presence or insertion into a problem area generates by its very nature more good. We make the dangerous mistake of seeing money as the thing in itself. We fail to see money as an exchange, as a medium, as a direct utility to be transformed into what does matter, what does have meaning. When we see money, we see meaning, and so we are delusional in this way. There is a historical precedent for some of our cultural affinity towards money. Our view of money is indicative of our general affinity for the idea that we can, regardless of birth or economic background, rise to great heights. Yet money in itself cannot elevate an individual, and alone is not an indication of greatness whatsoever. For we here will define greatness in our own terms, in human terms, not in abstract paper terms. To take an example which best suits this delusion we hold, let us take Steve Jobs, founder of Apple, as an example. Speech after speech and product after product, Steve Jobs revealed his true nature to us. He revealed a great drive to bring his ideas to fruition, to populate the world with that which he wishes to express onto it. At a glance, this may seem like an exaggerated case of self-expression, yet there are critical flaws. Here we see an individual who seeks to manipulate a populace into believing a certain product is in their best interest, by making himself fully aware of what would actually be in their best interest, making a symbol of that, and making a product which is a much cheaper and simpler version. Technology companies generally operate under two schools of thought, one being the idea that it is important to create great technologies, then seek to communicate and sell them or under the principle of great marketing, symbolism, and deception in order to sell a lesser cookie cutter product. What we end up with is a set of products with little to no choice or variation and a social concept of status which surrounds the brand name. Is this great? We seem to have this notion that upsetting the status quo, making lots of movement and noise, and of course, lots of money, makes someone great and brilliant. Yet if we take a step back and look at the consequences and correlations of such an event, do we not find a great deal of negative outcomes? Human rights abuses at overseas production facilities, lack of competition and variety to consumers, little to no change in new products, employees being treated abysmally, and an example for entrepreneurship which promotes cutthroat practices. So what is the greatness here? Yes, he willed his views onto the world with great effect, but admirably? Was this self-expression, or was this a feat in service of money as a good? Is this the type of greatness we should value as a culture? Let us take a look at the money itself, the fortune which he amassed and Apple continues to amass today. We must keep in mind that the money in itself is simply a symbol, a representation of possibilities both good and bad, and in itself holds no meaning. $1 million can provide for you for 10 years on a well above average salary level, or it can be a few extravagant nights out at the most expensive clubs in the world. Do we not see how the value of money changes so dramatically when there's no meaning and greatness in the life of the individual who holds it? As money is a representation of its correlatives, i.e. what it has been transformed from and what it is transformed into, the measure of an individual who has amassed a fortune must be determined as such. The simple possession of money gives no measurement, much like a pile of building materials gives no indication of what it may become. The materials may become a great castle of intricate design, it may become a school, a hospital, or it may become one giant home for a single person. 
As a collective, can we afford to place great valuation on the home serving as an egotistical feedback loop for a single individual? Should we treat this person with reverence? Yet before an individual is to be judged on what is done with their fortune, the derivative correlation must be determined. In other words, what transformed into this fortune which resides with this person? We see individuals on a regular basis amass fortunes from mundane at best and more often deplorable methods. Whether it is manipulative corporate and stock market practices, political bribery, fraud, or the fairly new form with the rise of an abundance of social media personalities which produce content that is hardly identifiable even as low-level entertainment. It is all the same. It is thriving off of the suffering of others. In many cases, this is not great suffering. It is simply the act of tricking common people into buying bad products, making poor investments, or consuming corrosive entertainment. If individuals transform their money into objects which, separate from the transaction, hold no significant valuation outside appeal to a bored, unhappy, wealthy individual, then how can this fortune be seen as great? If we seek fortune for the attainment of specific things, and not that which this rich person cares for, then how is this rich person's wealth deserving of admiration or status? It is not the tangible. Is it not the tangible, which is in the world of things that they may transform it into that would determine its worth? If this person will never make use of their fortune in any way which any of us would otherwise consider meaningful, admirable, or useful, what status or admiration do they deserve from our culture? It seems we are the authors of our own poor valuation by placing such a high degree of faith and meaning in an abstraction like money. To put things in a straightforward manner, we should not view individuals as great for having simply amassed a fortune, only by measure of what exactly they put out in exchange for that fortune. This is not meant to rebuke the notion that one should be able to get rich and amass wealth, but the perception of greatness towards the notion of gaining wealth through any means necessary is the exact factor which allows so many non-contributors to amass wealth to the detriment of the masses. Such a high volume of content which markets luxurious lifestyles is consumed out of simple envy feeding into this cycle. It is not to say that we should not consume any entertainment from wealthy individuals, but that we should consume it on the basis of the quality of the content, not the wealth of the individual, lest we continue to pump wealth into individuals who make no meaningful contribution to, well, anything. To clarify this elusive concept of money, we must say outright what it is. It is simply an abstraction. It is a useful, often great, sometimes bad, abstraction. It is not the thing in itself. One cannot achieve happiness by obtaining wealth alone because wealth in the form of money is not real. It is an agreed upon concept which is of great utility, but does not have the capacity to give feeling, good or bad, on its own. The attainment of a certain dollar amount can result in momentary joy as fleeting as a strike of lightning. More and more money is needed to experience this feeling again, however, and the constant representation of oneself as wealthy is necessary to obtain any benefits from it. On the flip side of the valuation of greatness, we have those who have, in parallel delusion, adopted a narrative which proclaims money as evil. Once again, we face the issue of seeing money as the thing in itself. These individuals often recognize those who have gained fortune through deplorable means, yet make the same mistake of placing the meaning in the money. They somehow see the money as the corrupting feature, the indicator of evil. Yet, conversely, they wish for these fortunes to be dispersed amongst those with less of it, for the sake of goodness? In their view of money, as the evil entity, they target any individual who has abundance of it without valuation of the correlative source of the money. So, if money isn't great, why do we want it so bad? Well, as Epicurus would remind us, what we really want is love, friends, and adventure. We are in a cycle of seeing people with money get attention from others, adopting that valuation, and seeking the money to get the attention ourselves. Yet it is only with the genuine friendship of others and the love of ourselves that we can use this money to elevate our lives. Be honest with yourself, express yourself, and the rest will come.